Hello, Internet. It's the Skeleton Crew coming at you with a brand new episode. In this episode, we're going to be reacting to the dinosaurs' designs of Jurassic World Evolution 2. I didn't call it Jurassic Park Operation Genesis that time, and that was the first try. You might not believe me, but you should. <laughs> uh, this week, we're going to be talking about Apatosaurus, but before we get into the, the fun of sauropods, uh, we're going to introduce ourselves. I am Alex Rubenstahl, a PhD candidate at Yale University, and today, uh, James Napoli could not defeat me in our race across the heavens, and I consumed him. He will return in a later time uh, as we continue this endless cycle. My name is Amelia Zitlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. My name is Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. And my name is Dalton Meyer. I'm a supplicant to RAW, and more importantly, a PhD candidate at Yale University. Boo, RAW! Apep or Apophis, whichever you prefer. Apophis, I think it is. Isn't it has Apep many names. the name anyway, of one of James' names. snakes? Yeah. He would do that. Yeah. That yeah, wouldn't shock me. He is a nerd. <laughs> and we... But together. But together. What are we? Most we of the are skeleton the crew. Skeleton crew. Asterisk. No, we're, we we're are all the statistically speaking the skeleton crew. He's in there, doing this for a very small section of our audience. Well, let's anyway. take a look at this critter. <laughs> so yeah, let's let's Here check out Patasaurus. Let's. Oh, I love this, this angle of really good. Oh, Amelia, <laughs> talk about it. A plus foot. It's got leaves. <laughs> it's got a screen. <laughs> that that kind of made is... it a little bit interesting. Actually, Scott, is that neck? It kind of looks. It's it's kind of it's not. If we if we look at it from from head on, it's very very much not. So, um, audience, we're going to be starting off right away with some criticisms of this design. Uh, one of the things that this design doesn't really capture is one of the more unique things about Apatosaurus and its uh, close relative Brontosaurus is they actually have fairly unique shaped necks uh, in that their uh, cervical vertebra uh, their cervical ribs, the little projections that come off the bottom of their uh, neck vertebrae actually flare out quite a bit. And uh, when you normally think of a sauropod, I bet you uh, kind of picture it having a more round neck like you see on a giraffe or kind of a human that's just kind of like sausage tube shape but Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus would have had a kind of more like sub triangular neck in cross section uh, and that is unfortunately missing on this model and it's one of the more unique things about Apatosaurus I haven't convinced myself I'm, it's missing yet. the more I look at it the more I can kind of see it. I feel like like they have this like ridge like here and here. Yeah, because this is a movie, it is a movie design, design, right? So I think it's yeah, obviously without saying different. feet bad. See your earlier videos about why feet bad. I'm I gotta Google the movie version because I I think even I think the neck looks better in this than in the movie, but it's still not quite there. The okay, movie is well, much more well, tubular. Um it's just like a, a long totally. tube. Uh this has some definition of like shape, but not, I think, as much as we would expect to see. Speaking of tubular, you know what's pretty, tubular? pretty tubular? The chase sequence from Point Break, which someone posted online like last night and I rewatched. Oh, I and love that Point so Break. Good. Anyway, did anyone see the remake? Um, yeah, no. 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 Why would I do that? Anyway, so Apatosaurus, for our viewers, who have never heard of Apatosaurus, which I find are probably not many. Um, it is a sauropod dinosaur from the late Jurassic of North America. Um, and what's a sauropod? It's the long neck boys. Yeah. The, it's the long neck ones. Uh, this is going to be rehashing some already kind of... some. Com Ooh, there's an ugly Camarasaurus yeah. behind us. Because we're representing the Morrison formation. Or at least the animals we've already talked about. So, Plodocus is here. Stegosaurus is here. Camarasaurus is All unfortunately your here. here. Yeah, no, it's not good looking. Anyway, so 
Apatosaurus within sauropod uh, belongs to the Diplodocoids. They are the long neck, long tail. We've already discussed the Diplodocus. Like that one back Diplodocus. there. <laughs> that was Jim Jimbo was trying to escape. I had to stop him. Um, yes, anyway, so uh, within Diplodocoids, there are many tribes. Uh, there's Diplodoki, uh, the Diplodocans, and the Apatosaurans. Um, there aren't a lot of species of Apatosaurine. There's Apatosaurus. And I mean, there aren't many genuses. My genera? There's Apatosaurus. Yeah. Genera. Oi. This is what happens when you don't sleep. You gotta sleep, everybody. Uh, there's Apatosaurus, and then... Ooh, most of the video is gonna be about the next thing. Brontosaurus. <laughs> there's also, like, debatably Whoa. that we don't even really know if it's really a Vesalius. Well... Ooh, yeah! I think, I think so. I don't actually pretty, remember where that goes. Conven convincingly argued to be a, uh, I think a Dicreosaur. Oh, really? I actually, I'm, I'm not... Ooh, that's very I'm confusing. not up on my Amphicelius lore. Yeah, so it got, it's not a Dicreosaur, excuse me, a Rebeccasaur. Um, it got... The yeah, it got renamed to Marapunisaurus. I guess there is the smaller species of Amphicelius. Oh. Um, which is more well-known than the big one that is totally known from a drawing, and that's it. So, um, okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the drawing is probably uh, Rebecca Sor. So, it's been renamed. audience, to get to clue also, to clue you in on the on the deep lore in which we are referencing um amphicelius is a long debated genus of uh sauropod dinosaur that was named during the bone wars by cope right uh no yeah, notorious yeah. truth seller a uh, truth teller and good scientist cope <laughs> notorious bone yes. war loser cope. um <laughs> where he reported this yeah single isolated sauropod vertebrae that was of such absolutely stupid gargantuan size that like if you were to scale up a diplodocus or a, I guess a diplodocid sauropod to match its size it would basically be indicating that uh, the sauropods that we have nowadays, the, uh, or nowadays, the sauropods that we know of <laughs> nowadays, we don't have any sauropods, sadly. Um, Where do you live? But, uh, yeah, it's different in Boston. I don't know. Um, the sauropods that we know of nowadays, even the absolutely large ones, things like Argentinosaurus and Dreadnoughtus and stuff like that, were like half the size of Amphicelius. It was an, it was like an like a biologically implausibly huge animal. Like we always say that these things were kaiju size, but this was like the kaiju of kaiju size. And it seems like in recent years, uh, that has been proven. Well, it, it, it's been more reclassified and therefore like brought more in line. Yeah. So the, the big mystery about it is there's, there's the, a known and established species of Amphicelius, Amphicelius altus, which is like normal-sized, respectable thing. And then there's this um, one vertebra from what was Amphicelius fragilimus that uh, Cope drew, apparently found. Uh, he made a drawing of it in the field, and when it was being shipped, at some point from being shipped to the field to being stored in the museum, it was lost and destroyed. And this thing is like one single vertebra that's like taller than a person. It's just monstrous. Um, you know, people have, have worked. On, it's a good drawing. You know, it's a very good drawing. So you can make observations off of it. And, you know, trusting that all of this is true. Trusting that like. That's a jump. The, yeah. Trusting that it's a legitimate find and that all the anatomical detail in the drawing is correct. Um, people have, have made various conclusions about it. The most recent work uh, was uh, Ken Carpenter in 2018 um, took a look at the at the drawing of the vertebra and uh, came to the conclusion that it's not a, diplodo a diplodosoid, a uh, diplodocoid, however you want to say it. I think we um, pronounce it every way possible in the series of videos that include these yeah. animals. The pronunciation doesn't matter so long as people know what you're talking exactly. about. Um, this is all... This is all nerd latin and greek you can say yeah. how, but, however you want uh carpenter concludes it's not uh a uh well this is a diplodocoid but it's not like an apatosaurine or a diplodocine it's a rebeccasaur um 
which we have an example of a Rebecca Sor in the game, uh, which is Niger Saurus, which we'll get to eventually. So it's part of this kind of shorter necked clade of diplodocids. Um, and in doing so, have, reconstructing it with the proportions of a Rebecca Sor, like a generalized kind of Rebecca Sor, it's still an enormous animal, but it's much more reasonable in its like enormous size. It's it's still How one big? of the largest sauropods of the Morris information, but it isn't like making a, uh, Argentinosaurus look like its pet. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's well, that's cool. our bit about the dinosaur that may may not have existed. What about this dinosaur that did exist? We haven't discussed yet what its name means. What does a patasaurus mean? Oh, f all right. So Patasaurus means deceptive lizard. Patasaurus Luise, Luise specifically is named for our Andrew Carnegie's wife. I forget exactly why, uh, but that's uh, where that comes from. And deceptive lizard, probably I am told. He, I wouldn't be surprised if he funded the dig. Yeah, well, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyways, and then the uh, deceptive lizard part of it, I am told. <laughs> is because the chevrons of Apatosaurus look like the chevrons of Mosasaurs, uh, which is disgusting and offensive, and I don't really believe it, uh, but whatever. Uh, so chevrons <laughs> are um, these little V-shaped bones that kind of go on the underside of the tail vertebrae in reptiles. Um, can one of you send a picture of one of these stupid things to the chat so I can confirm or deny their resemblance sure. to Mosasaurs? Because also, like, I wasn't aware of, like, a huge diversity in chevron shape to begin with. So I'm confused about the specific comparison to, to Mosasaurs. Actually, there's Unless it's, like... Fantastic. Well, you know, I mean, this was, this was back when dinosaur paleo was real crude and there were, like, 12 bones yeah. total. So, you know, you're comparing... You're comparing the fossils you find to literally everything else. And at this point, you know, we're going to the American Midwest and they're finding mosasaurs and they're finding sauropods. And it's important to be like, okay, what do these things look like? Also, I laughed earlier because I thought, what if, you know, Andrew Carnegie's, you know, he's hanging out and he's like, come, Marsh slash Cope, show me, show me the fossils you found. Uh, my wife desires uh, that, that I name one after her. Um, and then he picks one that looks like a, just the biggest one. And he's like, I've got, I'm going to start a fight. <laughs> okay, so having... <laughs> and he's like, hey, hey, dear, they found all the coffee. This horrible beast reminds me of you. Anyway, so having reviewed these pictures, I am going to tell you all that these look nothing like a Mosasaur chevron. <laughs> I was thinking... That's why it's deceptive. Like, that's why it's deceptive. Correct. Yeah, because I was thinking, like, okay, because, like, so, Mosasaur chevrons, there's actually two kinds. Like, it's actually one of the major distinguishing features of the two major clades of Mosasaurs. So you've got Mosasaurines, which are Mosasaurus platastes globidans, and Russellosaurines, which are Tylosaurus platycarpines. Um, in the Russellosaurines, the chevrons uh, articulate with the caudal, the, the tail vertebrae which means that they sit in little pockets on the vertebrae, but they're not fused to them. Uh, and in Mosasaurines, the chevrons are fused to the vertebrae. In either case, they look like little Vs. Mm -hmm. So the chevron itself is a little V that sits on the vertebra. This chevron, which I'm sure has been flashed on the screen, if not, it will be now, as you can clearly see, is not a V, it's a triangle. <laughs> There's a bar across the top um, that Mosasaurs don't have. Uh, there's a curvature that mosasaurs don't have. They're very straight. Um, they don't have this like distal expansion to them. I, this is ridiculous. They that that's hilarious. Who says well, that they look they like mosasaur chevrons? Let's get to a name. I think Marsh. Oh, well, they transition posteriorly. Like, as you go back on the tail, they change shape, which is a pretty common thing for uh, some dingosaurs. They kind of get I was gonna, yeah, no, and that, paddle to, and, like, they get these anterior and posterior processes. And that is something that mosasaurs don't do. They stay the same shape. They just get smaller. Well, maybe... That's hilarious. If we're, if, we're, if we're entitled to get, or inclined, rather, to give Marsh the benefit of the doubt, maybe it's that he only found, like, 
one of the more distal ones. But we're just like a chunk. <laughs> I, I guess distal wouldn't be the right not word. Not a we're single, the, the only part ones. of that bone that looks anything like a Mosasaur chevron is like the shaft, which looks like any other chevron. Like, again, the, the articular, the top part doesn't look like it, the bottom part doesn't look like it. So unless you found like the, the middle part of the V, which is just a cylinder and completely undiagnostic, Sure, they look the same there, I guess. Th this is giving some real, I am not uh, if my grandmother had wheels, she would have been a bike kind of energy. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a clip from, it's a clip from a British, like, morning show, where they bring in this Italian guy to make, um, to like to do a recipe and he makes like macaroni and cheese or something like that and one of the hosts says like oh you know if you chopped up bacon and threw this in here it would be like carbonara and he looks at her like she's grown a f second head and he's just like and if my grandmother had wheels she would have been a bike what the hell are you saying and she like almost oh, chokes funny. on the pasta and falls over he, he's just so and it's funny. it's he isn't even making a joke you can tell on his face he's being a hundred percent deadly serious that he's just like he's like it's an entirely different recipe how on earth do you think that these have anything similar to it? It's so, no, it's I... so funny. I have found the paper um, in which Marsh says this claim. It says, uh, Apatosaurus Ajax, another gigantic dinosaur allied to the above, referring to sauropods, uh, and of scarcely less interest, is represented by the Yale Museum by a nearly complete skeleton and excellent preservation. Less interest! Uh, it's like, oh, this thing's boring! <laughs> uh, Oh wait, we should also say what Ajax. Yeah, Ajax is named speaker. for the Greek hero Ajax. Uh, named after the the household cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it the anterior caudals are biconcave and their interior structure is cancellous? The chevron it's cancerous. Bones, cancellous. Well, it's got cancellous. canceled. Oh. It's referring to the many pockets. Yeah. It uh, it made a mistake on Twitter. <laughs> and it's, it's been canceled. Uh, it made a. It made not very, very, very funny. The chevron bones differ from those of most known dinosaurs in having the superior articular ends of the rami not united, but separated from each other, as in the Mosasauria with three hemopophyses. Oh. So, again, viewer, at this point, there are, like, that many dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm being uh, uh, exaggerating a little bit, but, you know. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't... Here we are now talking about them. And that's and, all that really matters. And according to someone whose opinion I trust greatly, these don't look like Mosasaur chevrons, and I concur. <laughs> Marsh was on something different that day. They really don't. He, he, you know, Marsh... They can't all be winning. He writes a lot of stuff. A lot of it misses, but when it hits, it hits. And this is just a miss. Find another one. A lot, a lot of it. Jesus Christ, so much good. <laughs> anyway, um, let's talk about. Speaking of not misses, though, let's talk about Bron Brontosaurus. Uh, does anyone want to do the history of Brontosaurus? Also, one of the best dinosaur yeah, names. I'm so happy it's to, uh, to spoil a little bit. I'm I'm so happy we can use it again because it is. One of the best species names. The Thunder Lizard? Ah, It's so good. That's... That's his genus yes. name. You said best species name. <laughs> we are the Knights of the Pedantry. <laughs> I also... I hold everyone to a standard I, I also, higher than I, do, I do want to chuckle just for a half a second that... that, that um, one of the sections in the Wikipedia article is called Skull Issue, and that makes me <laughs> laugh a lot. <laughs> Skull That's Issue. That's gotta be intentional. Um, That's the title of the video. Apatosaurus was first discovered in, uh, in 1877 in Morrison, Colorado, um, which I hear from another one of our skeleton crewmates. It has a really cool little local museum there. It does. I, I talk about it in our Q&A video, part two, which you should... Is that the one on. we went It is, to? yeah. We, we stopped there on our way to the Denver Zoo. Um, it's, that was very cool. What, what was that guy's the name? The guy who discovered it? 
No, the one. Oh. The... No. Uh, wait. Hold on. I have his business card. <laughs> he was very nice. He showed me some Matthew, Croc stuff. Uh, Matthew. No, I'm Moss gonna get there first. God. Matthew Moss Parker, who's the director there. It's a, it's, it's a museum that's in the town of Morrison, which is where they found Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus. Um, and it's it gives its name to the Morrison Formation. Um, it's a museum that's built in like a little house. It's a two-story kind of little country house. And it's small, but they, they pack an amazing punch. There's so much cool stuff in that museum. Um, I highly, highly recommend giving it a visit, if you're especially in the Denver area or going through there, it's really close to Dinosaur Ridge, which is one of the world's largest dinosaur track sites. So it's a really easy kind of three, yeah, like a three step day trip of seeing the Morris Museum, Dinosaur Ridge and the Denver Museum all at once. And they, they gave us a little Yeah, so tour, they have, right? they have really well-informed, like really well-trained staff at this museum. So basically you can go in and browse at your leisure and walk around, but it's, it's got, you know, it's never crowded. Is very small, and so pretty much whenever you go in, if you talk to one of the employees, they will give you a tour of the whole thing, and they will tell you about every single thing on display. And it's very interesting. Yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, from a from a Colorado boy, ten out of ten, I recommend it. Super cool. So um, after uh, so uh, it was discovered in uh, eighteen eight in eighteen seventy seven by this uh, local named uh, Arthur Lake. Who I I absolutely love the the what I am interpreting as a Giga Chad move here of he found this dinosaur and was like hey I know about these absolutely insane paleontologists and mailed both of them both Cope and Marsh saying hey I found this <laughs> new dinosaur and including uh, sending uh, sending them some fossils as well. And uh, Marsh immediately named it um, Atlan At Atlantosaurus. Um, it's a cool name. Which is a cool name, even though I I'm surprised it isn't like it didn't stick. But um, and Cope apparently tried to uh, purchase Lake Services and was denied. Um, <laughs> he told him, "Your money's no good here." Oh. Uh, and. Uh, a little bit later, Lakes found um, some more material that included uh, some absolutely fantastic postcranial material and a brain case, which is bonkers because we never find skull material of these things. And I'm sure that this will not rear its ugly head in the future. Um, but so, and this material was sent off to uh, sent off to Marsh, and he gave it the name. Apatosaurus Ajax. Very cool. Uh, and a couple of years later, uh, in 1879, um, Marsh was working uh, working with some people uh, still out in Colorado in the Morrison Formation, again named after the town, and it at a formation called Como Bluff, uh, they found another large sauropod. And this being the Bone Wars and everything being named different things, uh, it, it, it got named Brontosaurus Excelsus, which such a good name. Again, it is. I, I interject only as a, as, a, as a denizen of the West to clarify that Como Bluffs is in Wyoming, not Colorado. We have another night of pedantry. <laughs> Come, please step forward. That's fair. All right, so... <laughs> Not in Colorado. Good day, sir. Homo Bluff, Wyoming. <laughs> Apologies for all both people that live in Wyoming. Uh, <laughs> Neither of whom listen to this. <laughs> hey, you don't know. Maybe I do. I do support Wyoming slander. <laughs> but um, to uh, to again lean into uh, our defining of names because I think that both the genus and species name of Brontosaurus. Uh, are pretty are, are pretty cool because Brontosaurus, uh, meaning the thunder lizard, and Excelsis, meaning uh, noble or high. Um, which like, what a cool name! Like, what was what was what was he on for? Like, deceptive lizard that looks like a mosasaur versus like 
God. <laughs> the god creature. Did he do Allosaurus as well? Yes. Yes, he did. I don't... And it's yeah. like... It... Different lizard. What? Different lizard. It's different. It's built different. It's built different. No, you know, some of them, some of his names slaps. Good like name. Silurus, good name. Very descriptive. Fragilis. Turns out, it's, yes, pretty, it is. it's pretty fragile. Which Allosaurus isn't. Don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, but, I, yeah. Yeah, anyways. So this was, this was named as, uh, so Brontosaurus was named as its own dinosaur just a couple of years later. And it was relatively quickly that other paleontologists in the what the hell just happened to its That tail? was weird. That was like, weird as hell. It's like gravity suddenly started affecting it again. It was like... <laughs> it did the wave. Um, also, these things do the, the awful lay down like a mammal. Oh, they uh, do. It's oh awesome to address God. that here and now. Uh, yeah. And we won't talk about it again. But, um... Again, yeah, now, yeah, now it's fine. It kind of goes into an interim... Yeah, but in, in order to get into that posture, it would have had to break its spine. So, whatever. Yeah, and then it's also has to remind you of how stupid every time. Look every time but so um i'm sorry okay oh, so were... relatively quickly after the naming of brontosaurus a lot of other paleontologists including i believe like uh elmo riggs and stuff who was famous for the discovery and naming of uh brachiosaurus uh looked at this and were just like these are the same picture you you named an animal twice uh, and it was really quickly kind of like accepted in paleontology that like, Hey, Brontosaurus is probably just a species of Patosaurus. Um, I actually don't know when that was formally proposed. Yeah. Was this, was, was Marsh? Yeah. Dead let's yet? see. I'm curious. Because I don't know if I if I had named something Brontosaurus, I would have fought until I died. Um, to keep that valid name valid. Versus... Oh, it was uh, 1903. It was uh, oh, and I said his name wrong. It's Elmer Riggs, not Elmo Riggs. Um, <laughs> Did you say? I thought I was. I thought that was just Riverside glitching. You thought his name was Elmo. I thought it sounded wrong, but I didn't know enough to try and correct you. I was like, I thought it was Elmer, and then I thought, no, maybe I'm thinking of something else like the cartoon character or the glue <laughs> see the... like like being mac from always sunny about <laughs> stars you know burn all the trash and all that smoky that smoky smoke goes up in the uh, air where it creates stars see no in in my oh, head when i said funny. it i was just like is is this like a is this like a situation like um like kermit roosevelt where we just have random historical figures that are named like <laughs> muppets um but so, no, it's Elmer Riggs. Elmer Riggs was the one who proposed that um, Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were indeed one genus with two species. And since Apatosaurus was named first, it would be, instead of Brontosaurus excelsus, it would be Apatosaurus excelsus. This was in 1903. So I do believe that Marsh was still alive then. Nope. No? Marsh died in 1899. Ah, those, that fucking cowering oh, way was dead. <laughs> I can't prove that. But uh, so, viewer, you might you might be wondering why is it that uh, a name that was just like thirty years after it was proposed, and for a bit of time before then, kind of like not really considered to be like valid? Uh, why did that stick? And that's because of. Uh, Museums, namely, I believe the American Museum of Natural History. That oh, and the Peabody and the Peabody. Did they both have them labeled as Brontosaurus? Yep. There was, as, as we talked about in our Diplodocus video, there was a big rush of museums wanting to mount a sauropod dinosaur. Uh, this is often called the second dinosaur rush, and. Uh, with this uh, with this goal in mind of like, hey, if we get something this huge and impressive up on display, it'll bring in a lot of visitors and therefore a lot of money for our institution. And 
Uh, so, so this ultimately came down to the American Museum of Natural History and the Yale Peabody Museum, and uh, which which one was actually able to do it first? Was it Yale? I think it was probably Yale had a had a brontosaurus first, but I don't know for Maybe. sure. Maybe. Hmm. Um, looking to see if I can see it. So the American Museums was completed in 1905. You can see that. I don't know when the Peabody's went up. It was before that. Well, okay. R- regardless of who actually got one up first, um, both the American Museum of Natural History and the Yale Peabody Museum uh, were successful in mounting some impressive sauropod dinosaurs, and both of which named theirs Brontosaurus. And being that these are major museums in large cities, a lot of people went through these. And with the name Brontosaurus plastered all over it and it being a major tourist attraction, that name really got kind of, like, really jammed into the pop culture as, like, the first and, for a lot of people, only long neck dinosaur that they'd ever see. Uh, so the name Brontosaurus kind of became more or less synonymous with sauropods in general for a very long time. And this kind of goes to show that, like, I've heard people ask me before uh, of the different museums I've worked at, of like, are there situations like that today? Or have museums kind of learned from, oh, we can't have, we can't have this labeled with an, an inaccurate name for a while or else it'll stick in the public consciousness. Uh, no, this happens all the time. Uh, it's normally just with way less uh, popular animals than the first ever mounted sauropods. Uh, in fact, back when I was a whole lot more religious in doing my Fossil Fridays, uh, it was a really, really common occurrence to start writing up something about an animal, do a little bit of searching into it, and find out that uh, the am and or Michigan's, like, tag on it was incorrect, and it actually is known by a different name now. But, um, so, it took, what was it, like, 60, 70 years for the am at least, to update their label on the Apatosaur- uh, on the Apatosaurus and actually name it Apatosaurus? Oh, yeah, Amelia, what's your thing? Yeah, sorry, just because of the delay, I wanted the heads up. So, you know, what's what's cool about this is we, the, we as in the AMNH, still has the old skull models from when it was Brontosaurus, including a label calling it Brontosaurus, down in the big bone room. So here's one of them. And there, I mean, it's going to be out of focus, so what's going to happen is I'm going to send this to the chat, and you guys can uh, flash it on screen. But we have this model, which the label says this model was of the skull... Um, it was not on the skeleton, but it says, like, as you can see in the skeleton opposite, and it's apparently based on the Yale specimen and something called Morosaurus. Ah. Mm-hmm. The allied genus Morosaurus. So I wonder if that was Camarasaurus or something. Um, because the skull looks no, a lot more like Camarasaurus like. than... Okay, well, I don't know where it is then. I, I don't know. Uh, there we go. Messenger. Oh, uh, anyways, I will say no, that. No, no, Morosaurus is Camarasaurus. Never mind. You were correct. Thunder. Oh, wow! <laughs> owned. Me. He just got owned. Ring the owned counter. Listen, oh, Scott listen. got owned. He tries to mansplain me. Look at look where that got you. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. In the third doghouse. That wasn't nice. Oh, I, I like that one. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, so, so we have that so, one, and then... Mm. Disarticulated and loose on that same shelf, I believe, is the skull that was mounted on the skeleton initially. But now the one, if you visit nowadays, it's Great like Great amphibious dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, if you visit nowadays, it's a much more apatosaurus I I think it is labeled a patasaurus now, but I don't know. Well, that's what the Yale skull was, right? Well, that's what it was, yeah. yeah, once it got remodeled. So the thing about the Yale skull, and this contributes to a story that I'm sure we're going to get to about the, the skulls of Apatosaurus on display. They didn't find one um, for a long time. And so Brontosaurus, they were like, oh, we don't know what the head looks like. So they substituted they substituted it with essentially a Camarasaurus skull. 
which is where a lot of the old depictions of brontosaurus come from. Um, the American Museum skull, which we've shown, much more closely resembles a Camarasaurus because I think it was based on more material before updating it in, I think, the 1980s or 70s. I don't, I'd have to double check. Um, but the Yale Peabody's skull was this horrible sculpture that kind of looked like a, a horse with a blowhole. Um, and it <laughs> had like the tip of a dentary and a, and a maxilla, a premaxilla on it that came from a Camarasaur. And then they sculpted the rest of it based off of various other remains, apparently. Um, and that was on the uh, that was on display in the Peabody for oh some my time. God, you're right. I just I, I googled the 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 skull again because I forgot what it looked like. Oh, that is heinous. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know how they they came to the conclusion. Oh, that's horrific. Oh yeah. yes, I'll yeah, put yeah, it yeah. in the chat. Um, Everybody I don't was know how so they came to the conclusion that it looked like that, but they were wrong. <laughs> and then, yeah, then we replaced the skull with a with a cast of a patasaurus. Um, oh, Scott and I sent ah! it to the chat at exactly the same time. That I love it. That's a it's so bad. I oh love my it. god! Um, yeah. You know what's funny is it's only marginally worse than a normal sauropod skull. <laughs> yeah, see, what what I was going to say was, what, what I find funny about it is if you, like, shave off the weird, like, nasal bulge thing, it, it doesn't look dissimilar from an Apatosaurus skull, if you just shave that bit off. I guess. In very broad strokes, I in suppose. In, in the broadest strokes possible. Hey, we're, we're being charitable to people mm. this episode, apparently. Yeah. Hello, friends. Do you want me to Are do we? a skull drawing of the horse? Reply in comments. <gasps> no. <laughs> I would horse love that, horse. honestly. <laughs> haunts, haunts, haunts. Haunts. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, but, so because there was this skull debacle of like, oh, we didn't know what the skull looked like, a lot of people have the misconception that the, the brontosaurus, brontosaurus isn't real. Right, Brontosaurus is just a Patasaurus. There's a, a, a misconception that even I had as a child that that was because, oh, they thought they had the skull and then they found the correct skull and then they realized, oh, it's just a Patasaurus. Yeah. When in fact, this conclusion was drawn well before all of the skull debacle on the mounting did. That was just based off of the, the postcranial bones that, that they had found. Um, it just also so happens that there was drama about the skull. And once again, the game has like suddenly had gravity affected. Yeah, that was, that weird. was weird. Yeah, uh, this dinosaur for a really long, or, or Brontosaurus for a really long time was the favorite territory of pedantic children, mostly including myself, <laughs> um, that would absolutely oh, yeah. love to, like, I'd talk to adults and they'd be like, oh, my favorite dinosaur is Brontosaurus. And he'd be like, um, actually, Brontosaurus isn't real. It's really called a Patasaurus. They got the head wrong and it was the same animal and stuff. And Jesus Christ, uh, you did such a good job good, with that good, voice that I want to punch you. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I, I want to punch myself <laughs> for remembering when I also... I think we, just, I think we yeah, all did that. Yeah. I was poorly socialized as a child you, yeah. and didn't do sports. I yeah, I didn't care enough to be pedantic about that. That's fair. I I did correct. That. Um, but so this was fertile ground for uh for pedants to correct lay people at parties uh about. You dinosaurs. think these people were invited to parties? <laughs> Well, what they call I mean, I'm including myself in this. Th th this is this is entirely self-deprecating. I'm, I'm not calling functions. out anybody. More than seven people. I'm, in I'm not calling out anybody who isn't currently in this Riverside recording. <laughs> um, well, okay, James as well. I'm yeah. calling him out too. You're not getting out of this. Oh no, he's here. Alex is here. Oh yeah, no. There's a. There are, there are members of this chat that. I think I think we all probably did this yeah. again for probably. But so this this was something that you could do with a a degree of accuracy until 2014. It's 2015. It's 2015. <laughs> okay. I'm being stupid. Uh, let me was see. Right? 
you might be right. Another another victory on the field of battle for the Knights so, of Pedantry. This was something that you could do with a pretty good degree of accuracy until 2015, when a paper by Emmanuel Chop um, and some colleagues, uh, notably my biological mother and James's as well, uh, was uh, which was doing some. I'm, I'm, if memory serves, unrelated taxonomic, like, cleanup in sauropods, and then go on, it Alex. Was, it was a specimen level, like, review of, of diplodocoids. Of diplodocoids, sorry. Yeah, that would be a little bit too much. But so, for our audience, and we will do a phylogeny video at some point, I promise, because we all think it's important. Um, Often, when you're doing phylogenetics uh, for dinosaurs, you know, you don't have complete fossils. So for a taxa where you say you only have one single specimen, it's very easy just to score. You know, you're scoring your matrix that you use to construct the tree, uh, the, the physical features of the animal from that one specimen. But often, uh, for organisms known for multiple specimens, you are scoring a composite uh, that is different specimens for different features. There are issues with this, um, and not not that you shouldn't do it, because you know if you're confident in the taxonomy, you want a more complete scoring. But in cases where perhaps the taxonomy is not well established, this can lead to uh, these chimeric taxon uh, ta taxa that are misleading your tree. So what was what? What was attempted and performed uh, was a specimen level, so that is every separate diagnosed individual is scored in a matrix. Is I think the matrix itself was a new construction I as well, so. right? Or or built from prior ones with many new characters added. I can't remember off the top of my head, but every single specimen was treated differently, and an analysis was run to reconstruct the relationship of diplodocoids from that as opposed to using composite scoring. Uh, and the results uh, were that they found Brontosaurus as a, well, what was at the time uh, Excelsus. Mm -hmm. Excelsus, yes, thank you. Uh, as as kind of outside all the other Apatosaurus species. And that's with, with, with a number of, of morphological differences, um, at least in that topology, that were like, hey, this could be its own uh, genus, and we're going to resurrect Brontosaurus Excelsus. 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 I, Excelsus. Oh, Christ. Kids, get one yeah, for us. Yeah, I, I remember um, it was kind of like a almost a haha -ha oops kind of result that, like, mm -hmm. uh, Emmanuel wasn't looking yeah. to, like, I want to bring Brontosaurus back. It was just a happenstance of the work. Here's a well, it's an absolute beast of a manuscript. I think it's like two hundred pages long because it is like, oy, oy, oy vey, which is great, very detailed. That's what <laughs> that's what I wish all phylogenetic and taxonomic work was, um, because it's you know it's at least a good proving ground for future work. But yeah, so like, yeah, like Scott said, this was this was a result from a larger, uh, and exhaustive, uh, kind of. Kind of in the same vein as Sterling Nesbitt's uh, Sterling, a phenomenal archosaur paleontologist, due to this huge treatment of archosaur relationships, uh, just this monster that became essential to defining phylogeny for that part of the field. So yeah, mm -hmm. very cool paper. Two hundred and ninety pages, work. just under three hundred. Wow, that's wow. Looks like Scott's oh wrong again. The Knights of Pedantry. Um. That that's more that that's a dyslexia one. No, that right. was a rounding up by two. <laughs> Ooh, not three hundred though. Um, but not so, Zack Snyder's three hundred. Uh, one one of the things I remember about this is that this that paper dropped the day before we got to sauropods in my paleontology class taught by Jeff Wilson, um, who's uh, also a sauropod paleontologist, and I, I remember that. Uh, the intro slide of that section uh, for our lecture that day had a picture of the uh, the Brontosaurus skeleton at uh, Carnegie. Um, 
and it had a, the very funny caption of Brontosaurus Excelsus, formerly Apatosaurus Excelsus, formerly Brontosaurus Excelsus. <laughs> and I remember chuckling at that. <laughs> but yeah, so Brontosaurus, yeah, yeah. Brontosaurus is back, back in fashion. You can still say you could say the Brontosaurus is your favorite dinosaur again. And uh, one of the things that I remember like getting asked a bunch about when this paper dropped was essentially like, oh, so what did Brontosaurus look like? And he was like, what? <laughs> no, like, like the change isn't that like we found more material and turns out there's this other thing that is Brontosaurus. It's more the animal itself, nothing changed to it and uh, changed about it, but our understanding of the animal did. Kind of like uh, the reclassification as Pluto being not a plant. That like Pluto didn't change. Think, Our well, understanding of that changed. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would draw a slight distinction between the reclassification of Pluto versus Brontosaurus and that uh, there are pretty robust criteria by which Pluto is not a planet. Well, yes. And I, I think this would be a good opportunity for us to very briefly, if we haven't talked about this before, um, share with our audience how uh, genera aren't <laughs> real. Yeah. Sort of. Um, so if you're familiar with the classic Linnaean system, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. It's ranked. It's not really how we do taxonomy anymore, but there's a lot of holdover from the old system. And the binomial naming system is good and still used. So the, the, the finest grain of that is the species, which are real most of the time and probably. A biological species should be a distinct thing, uh, often defined as something that is reproductively isolated. Um, this is obviously a definition that only applies to some things and absolutely none of them are fossils because we can't tell if fossils are reproductively isolated. We've tried. So there are other... Uh, <laughs> Rub the bones together. Nothing came from it. We don't know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of species concepts. This, this is often like, oh, biologists don't know what they're talking about. It's a little <laughs> bit true. But it's more important that species concepts are, are like tools, Right. It would be very hard to find one that is universal, universally applicable, um, especially for fossils and, you know, for plants where hybridization is more common. And bacteria is bacteria, real, etc. real funky. It's a mess, right? Like it's, you know, and we all have like endosymbiosis, whatever. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so the idea is, though, that species are kind of a real thing. Hopefully, yes, they should be. I think they are. Um, as, as real as anything on the constant, like, evolving gradient of life can be. Reproductively isolated, sure. However, the, the thing above that, the genus, uh, the genera, uh, the Tyrannosaurus of Tyrannosaurus Rex. The Homo of Satan. That is... That, yes, thank you, the Homo of Satan. The Boa. It's my favorite Boa one. Constrictor. The Gorilla of Gorilla. The, of Gorilla, Gorilla. Uh, <laughs> the Bison of Bison. The, the, the Felis. <laughs> Felis Domesticus. All right, we all know the name. We're all good scientists. That, ge the, the genus, is defined by nothing. <laughs> it is, it is defined, well, I shouldn't say nothing. It is defined in that it is the rank above species. So you can run into these wacky problems where you have like a genus of mollusk that exists for 400 million years because it's like got 300 species in it. Or, you know, like aardvarks, which are the only member of their genus. It's not a biological thing that the designation of one is completely arbitrary. Um, and if it's not going to break up a monophyletic group, calling the sister group of all the other apatosauruses, if there are, you know, distinct physical differences, apatosaurus blank versus brontosaurus blank, it's fine. And useful. It's fine. Yeah. And use. Yeah. Now Dalton actually has, there are, there are thoughts on how a, how a genus might be used in, in a way that's, not arbitrary uh none of this is recognized but i don't know don't, my own personal philosophy of genera or... sure especially and this is only for the fossil record because in the in the modern realm i mean mm -hmm. taxonomists steal with things in any case especially with regards to fossils i think genera can have a use which is to say we're not electing to show these as like 
biologically important categories. They're, they're just another kind of clade, right? So in the same way that mammals is a clade, a genus is a smaller clade. Um, and it's worthwhile to give it a name, um, especially in the case of making a binomen. But with fossils, it can be useful, I think, to generally default to a new genus for the sake of both clarity and robustness, right? Like if your phylogenetic hypothesis is changing and things are going to bounce around the tree a lot, especially if you have fragmentary material, but you that, but that is not so fragmentary that you don't think it's worthwhile to just not name it at all. Um, but if you have something and you're going to name it, naming it a new genus kind of future proofs it from changes in tree topology, which are almost guaranteed to happen. Um, then it, it saves future paleontologists from having to rename it in a new genus and then create decades of taxonomic confusion. Uh, the other thing that is that could be useful with genera in the fossil record, something that I would advocate for, is to try not to have genera cross geologic formation boundaries and like large spatial boundaries. Because that's where we have unknown gulfs of time between these things existing. And it's it's just, I think, better housekeeping of the, the nomenclature to keep those separate than to invoke the idea that there is this kind of continuous, very small clade that's persisting for millions upon millions upon millions of years. Amelia? Yeah, and like, I just wanted to kind of add to this thought, because I, obviously, I think we're, we're all kind of a, a similar opinion about how to deal with genera. The important thing to know about it, like when genus names do change, is it doesn't necessarily mean that the relationships or the appearance of the animal has changed at all. It's just, it's literally just a way for us to better categorize things, like especially with fossil animals. Like we were kind of getting at, like with living yeah. animals, I think we have just, because we have their DNA, we have a much better sense of how these things are all related to one another, and I think genera and living animals are much more helpful in that sense. But like with fossils, like the thing that I run into with, with my own corner of the sandbox are uh, prognathodon. A lot of people complain about it being split or not being split or whatever, and like I have my thoughts about it that I can't share right now, but it's when I try to ask people why they feel the way they do about doing one thing or the other, um, a lot of folks kind of come up with an, an arbitrary explanation, you know, and I try to explain that's no more or less valid than keeping them together or splitting them or whatever, and the same thing goes for Varanus. So that's actually a living species where this is a topic of discussion among some herpetologists not really um but uh there's because there's a lot of different species of varanus these are monitor lizards and they look a lot of them look a bit different from each other uh, but they're all the same genus and so a lot of folks will say we should split them up because they look different and like that's not how it works like if they are still a monophyletic group if they're still all related to more related to each other than they are to anything outside that there's no reason to split them other than to create confusion. And I guess I know with living animals, there's, I've heard an argument, the only decent argument I've heard for it is like for conservation purposes, if it's a new genus, you can get special funding or whatever. And like, sure. I guess that makes sense, but that's also stupid. And I wish funding didn't work that way. Cause like, that's not a reason to tamper with, you know, our categorization of, of these animals and make it help for anybody else trying to work on them. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't mean to give the impression, uh, that, but in, in saying that genera are arbitrary, I add, I like Dalton advocate for erecting new genera because it is useful and, and like Amelia discussed, um, yeah, we are, you know, the skeleton crew, we're, call us Oppenheimer because we are still <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> And all, all, all lumpers do is take L's. That's L for lumpers. <laughs> um, I'm glad you liked it. I was, I've been thinking about it for a, ever since Amelia started. Also, Valor. Amelia, it sounds like you're, you're, uh, like you, you've synced up with us a bit more. Have I? But yeah. Any, anyway, so. um, sounds like it. No, I haven't because you guys had like and, two seconds. And earlier, I said. That. That. Oh. Earlier, I, I just very briefly, I did say, you know, if you get something that's outside of the rest of the group, you know, you might as well call it a genus. That is only true if it doesn't have the defining features of, that it's like, if, if a species or existing genus is defined as, you know, something that has X, Y, and Z features, then it goes in there. It, it goes in the group. But if it's different, if it's, you know, if it's right next to it, 
but there are some features that differ. But then you got in, then I think there's a case to make a new genus instead yeah. of redefine the species. So, like, hmm? cool. I just, I just, I'm just ah. clarifying. Uh, so position. this is, um, I'm gonna be Dalton for a half a second, and not to belabor the point, <laughs> but uh, I've been had. <laughs> you've been had. Uh, Simply this fantastic. This is a very similar, at least outcome of a situation to the whole triceratops torosaurus thing where it's like uh that like nothing about the look of either of these animals necessarily changed it's more just our understanding also this video is being recorded on july 17th 2023 so is Something this information is out of date that yeah. that's one Nicole. of the things that I, I actually think is like super interesting about paleontology. That even though it's even though it's an, a field that's comprised almost entirely of digging up crap from rocks, it's not written in stone, and everything changes all the time. And so, like th things change all the time, and uh, take most things that are said about fossils with a big invisible asterisk next to them that reads down to the footnotes that says as we understand right now unless we tell you it in which forever case it's completely correct unfailable truth um but yeah uh let's see so uh, we I, we've, we've talked a bit about um yeah, sorry, the difference between or i guess apatosaurus versus brontosaurus and all that stuff but what can we say about like apatosaurus and probably by extension brontosaurus because they're incredibly similar animals <laughs> uh, in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Do they get the teeth right on this one? Uh, not... They seem to scream a lot. So let, let's, let's see. Wait, yeah, it'll open his mouth there. Got a very defined. It really does. The head's That's pretty ugly. The head's ugly. Like it, I do remember in the in the movie where they have that close up of the absolutely gorgeous animatronic of the one that's dying. Yeah, it's a very sad, sad scene. scene. Although like I, I the, the, the monster Yeah, although I was distracted because I was just like, wow, that kinda isn't really what an apatosaurus head looks like. Ooh, it's we should probably talk about the moment skin. I will say, because they used a puppet and it was really it, good the puppet, puppet was great. Oh yeah, no, no, no. The moment works. Oh goodness, not, we're not. So those aren't. They're not the worst no. I've seen, but they're they go back too but far. They go back. Yeah. It looks like they're going. Yeah. They should just be kind of restricted right up to the front here, uh, but they well, go. Okay, he needs to open his mouth more. Oh no, never mind. We can we can go in his mouth. They do sometimes open their mouth more. There's a theme in our <laughs> channel emerging. Going straight down dinosaurs. I remember when people were suggesting to me, oh, you need to use the flying, like the camera mode. I don't think they anticipated that I would only use it to get close ups of the dinosaurs' open mouths. Hey, sometimes we do it to get dinosaur feet pics. This is the tool of a pervert. Yeah. Oh. And I'm uncomfortable with how, how much I'm mastering its use. It's that, it's that meme that went around on TikTok a while ago of just like, relax, I just want to take some pictures. So in both occasions, the teeth go back too far in the mouth, but it's also got it's not the worst skin. tooth model, especially given that they're pretty low poly. So yeah, it also it should have scales. Yeah, but that's kind of hard at this like... scale for well, lack of a. But um, t I, I will say that prehistoric planet or prehistoric kingdom does it. I, so, I can I can chalk the skin here to just being how like they texture the things. That's fair. But one thing I, I can't chalk to how they texture things is the skin. And by that I mean the pattern and how it looks. Hmm. Uh I think that Man, this is a boring animal. <laughs> like there are no interesting skins no. for a Patasaurus in this game. None of them look that great. They're all Which, real drab and dull. You know, we've talked about on the channel that big animals tend to be drab. So, you know, maybe that's doing it a favor in terms of realism, but I, I'm not satisfied with it. Yeah, we, we don't have James here to defend uh, boring dinosaurs, so I will pummel them <laughs> into the ground. 
and say that I hate how this animal looks and I think it's really, really, it, it, it puts me to sleep looking at it. But one of the things that I think would have made this animal a whole lot more interesting is if they leaned into uh, a newer hypothesis that came out around the time that um, Jurassic World premiered um, regarding uh, Brontosaurus and by extension Apatosaurus. And that has been given the incredibly fun, flashy name of the Bronto Smash hypothesis. Um, which, crazy name aside, essentially is arguing that, as I said at the beginning of this video, that uh, Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus have weirdly shaped necks for sauropods. That that's kind of sub-triangular, as I said, cross-section of the neck is not typical for sauropods. Uh, like, I don't think any of them were, like, literally, like, the kind of, like, sausages we kind of picture them as, but they generally don't look like that. And one of the more interesting features that uh, Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus have on their necks are those cervical ribs that are projecting downwards have a weird structure on them that has been named the ventrolateral processes. And essentially, if you look at the neck of most... Um, so if you look at the neck of... Uh, the neck vertebrae of most other sauropods, they have... their cervical ribs are really relatively delicate. They're really long and they kind of have this little kind of like 90 degree angle where they kind of project downwards and then have a long kind of spindly bit that goes backwards. Uh, on Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, that really isn't the case. And they kind of have this more enlarged bulbous process that sticks out there that again, they, they named the ventrolateral process. And it has been hypothesized that these were essentially uh, kind of barriers to help protect the vulnerable esophagus, trachea, and blood vessels and stuff like that from downward impact. That these could have uh, been useful if the animal was, as it also seems like it was, uh, with some of the muscle attachment points, bringing the neck downwards very quickly and hitting stuff with it, whether that be predators or, as the Brontos mass hypothesis poses, other brontosaurus in a similar uh, mating display as we see in modern giraffes, and I think also some large tortoises do something similar. But uh, I've also gone, I've, I've seen some artists go so far as to even illustrate Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus having these keratinized kind of pads that correlate to those ventrolateral processes, or sometimes in more extreme cases, spikes on the underside of the neck that, uh, would have made it so these guys kind of would have fought in a way that was uh, similar to, actually similar to what you see in prehistoric uh, prehistoric planet with the Dreadnoughtus. Except mm. instead of the inflatable neck bits, they have spiky neck bits, and they would hit each other with their necks. Uh, from what I understand, it is not an implausible idea. But that being said, we don't know that they did this. Yeah, and like, oh good, I'm just checking to make sure the delay didn't screw me. Um, this is one of those cases where it's important to remember that just because an animal could do something, theoretically, doesn't mean it did. Um, and this is something in extinct animals, because we cannot actually observe them behave. It's really hard to know for sure without some kind of direct evidence that they actually did this. Um, so, like, for example, we can assume that one animal predated on another, but until we find gut contents, there's no way to know for sure. In this case, like, just because hypothetically mm -hmm. these, um, the, the vertebrae are shaped the way they are, and they could have supported this kind of movement, 
it does not mean that they were being used for that behavior. It's just one possible explanation. Um, again, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just is something that we will fundamentally never be able to know for sure, probably. Unless we find some, like, kind of almost ankylosaur-adjacent, like, ritualized injuries of, like, several of them. Yeah. Have, like, compression fractures yeah. on the underside of those, um, right. like, on those ventrolateral and processes, to- on those cervical ribs and stuff like that. To my knowledge, I'm willing to be corrected if this is wrong. We don't have any evidence of injuries on those vertebrae in that that would suggest that kind of behavior, right? Or do we? No. I, no, and they're pretty fragile. I mean, well, I mean, they're huge, yeah. right? But I, don't, I just don't know if anyone's looked for it. They Sorry. are very airy. Cervical vertebrae are just so full of, especially in these animals, are, are incredibly pneumatic and... We do have evidence of like infections, especially in one diplo- uh, diplodocoid. I think Diplodocus actually, which is really cool. No, it's not Diplodocus. It might be in Diplodocus. Doesn't matter. Um, but to my knowledge, we don't have evidence of that kind of, of ritualistic combat or injuries that would be, you know, sustained right. from it. Mm-hmm. Um, it like that being said, it would have been cool, and I do like the re- some reconstructions I've seen that kind of lean into that hypothesis of showing those more kind of like distinctive features on what is otherwise Mark 1 Mod 0 sauropod and kind of making it look a little bit more unique or e- even mm-hmm. it, it couldn't ne- necessarily eh, sorry I'm eating my sentence here it could also be a not necessarily a structural like element to the design. It could be a behavioral one. This is actually a, a fun, um, uh, a fun thing that was taught to me when I was uh, in South Africa on a photo safari. That uh, the way to tell a male and a female giraffe apart, if you can only see their heads, is that females have hair on their ossicones and males don't. That really? is not because the males don't grow hair there. That's because they beat the shit out of each other with those ossicones and rub all the hair off. <laughs> that you can tell when a young male giraffe has started to reach sexual maturity when they lose the hair on the top of their ossicones because they start sparring with each other. Hmm. And since females don't do that, they don't lose that hair. So if anything, if, if they cool. were doing something similar to that with their necks and it doesn't even need to be like as violent as the Bronto smash hypothesis suggests of like these things literally like slamming entire tree trunks into each other and trying to break their necks. It could just be like a pushing contest or something like that. It could just be more like uh, like calluses and stuff on the underside of the neck. Yeah. That would be, yeah. Okay. I think it'd be cool to integrate something like that if they put Brontosaurus into the game mm. as a good as a good distinction, and then hopefully they can also make a nicer looking sauropod. But obviously they're you know limited with the this is a this is in the movie, so they have to have the constraints of the design of the movie, which is very very plain Jane. Um, really is. It I like really the social is. animation though. They've, we've seen it a couple times. I think it's sweet. They kind of like tap each other's heads. It is sweet. It, it's actually, um, it's reminding me, if memory serves, uh, bringing back to our stream, I think the Jagged Fang design uh, of Apatosaurus has uh, it neck does. spikes on the underside. It, or at least it had like glosses. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I recall, I, I, I think I recall that, which it was cool. It is a cool design. That was a cool design. It was a- Look Shout out to Jagged Fang. Like Do we? Thank you, Jagged Fang. Do we have anything else to say, or should we go to the species viewer? I think I'm at. I think it's time. I'm. I'm also. I've exhausted the stunlock that I have. Then let us go. I'm just gonna. In the meantime, can. In the meantime, can you remind me where Camarasaurus and Diplodocus are? Because those are the other sauropods we've done, right? Yeah. Camarasaurus is D. Camarasaurus Lodicus is C, if memory serves. Okay, I think so.
Uh, let me let me pull up my. Let me, let me just excuse whip this me out. while I whip this out. I'll be right back. I need to put. I have like a, a wand with a string on it that you can put toys on for a cat. And this one uh, was ambitious and, and screwing around with it, and he got it like wrapped around his foot or something. So I hope. The oh. audio of him tearing across the apartment, panicking with the string around his <laughs> leg, is not audible. But anyway, he's escaped it now and now refuses to leave. I didn't my hear pet. it. Okay, I'll be oh. right back. Such, such noble, elegant, and intelligent creatures. <laughs> uh, I, I can it's stream sorry. for the tier list. Okay. Okay. Actually, I can. That color's. I forgot that, that you could even put like stripes on them, and I'm like so, uh, I'm I'm impressed by that. The bar is that. But like low. the stripes aren't even that good stripes. They're just they're they're just little. It's just a sprinkling of stripes just on the middle of the back. It's boring. Yeah, it's not great. Um. All right, I'm gonna start because I launched the video and I've decided that I will give my opinion first. I think that a Patasaurus is a C. Allow me to explain. Um, it's just kind of like there. It, it, it has the shape, sort of, kind of, mostly of an Apatosaurus. The color's not particularly exciting. The stripes on the back are like fine, but the sounds are fine. The social animation's sweet, but it's just it's fine. It's so fine. It's not offensive to look at like the Camarasaurus. But it's not even as interesting as the Diplodocus. So, uh, and a Margosaurus is much cooler. That's the best sauropod we've done so far. Um, so, right, it's, it's, it's C, but after Diplodocus, in my opinion. Well, hang on. I'm I getting passed. something. I'm getting a signal from inside of Alex. Oh, God. What? It's it's James. I can hear him in the in the echoing chasm that is Alex's yawning gullet. Uh, his rating is a B. He doesn't hate it. It isn't ugly, but it could be much better. Like many of the Jurassic World movie designs. All right, um, I'll go next. Um, I'm torn because I do like it better than Diplodocus, but we have Diplodocus at C, and this is not B, so. Yeah, like, it's not, I don't know, I'm not offended by it. I like this blue. I like that they tried to give it stripes. Um, I'll give it a, I'll give it a C, but above the plot. Hmm. Scott. Um, I'll say I'm a bit offended by it. I don't like <laughs> it. I think it's boring. Um, it, it, Apatosaurus falls into a similar category as Stegosaurus and Triceratops for me. It, not necessarily in the game, but just in general. That like they're so like the default depiction of them is so often so lackluster, boring, and like just bad that whenever I see a good depiction of one, it kind of reminds me, oh shit, this is an absolutely gorgeous animal. And that being said, this is a very boring, very typical representation of a patasaurus. I can tell it's a patasaurus. Um, so but like it doesn't give me pleasure. So see. I'm gonna I'm what? relative to Diplodocus how in the C tier. Oh god, was I the last one? I'm no, sorry. I'm I am, but I I, I it's gonna matter. That's hard to say. Um, uh, oh, cool. I would say... Above Diplodocus. Okay. Well, this is also, for me, a C-tier design. It's it's an Apatosaurus. And, and, you know, you look at it, and you're like, yep, sure is one. But yeah, it doesn't inspire any joy in me it's fine it's i the colors aren't particularly evocative 
it's it, it inherits some of the in the dumpiness of the movie design and yeah this isn't frontiers like i don't blame frontier for this this is just them you know dealing with what they got from the movie um I, bl- I blame that hack, yeah. J.J. Abrams. Thanks, J.J. Abrams. I was so about to say, to what did J.J. do? <laughs> Darth J. Dar- about... J.J. Binks. Jar Jar Abrams, oh. whatever. Um, no. No. Um, the one thing I'll say for this is I like, again, I like its animations. I like its social animations. I kind of like just its ambient animations. I think it carries itself with an elegance that some of the sauropods are lacking. Um, especially Diplodocus. Especially Diplodocus, which makes this hard because I earlier today I was like, oh, this is a C below Diplodocus. And the reason for that is that in the silhouette, Diplodocus is more striking. Mm-hmm. And it's more clearly, ah, yes, Diplodocus. Whereas this is kind of like, ah, yes, a sauropod. Um, it does have, I think, a bit more... It's got more personality than the Diplodocus, though. Interesting. It's a C, and I think I'm going to put it below Diplodocus. But that's two... So now we've got two Cs below Diplodocus, two Cs above Diplodocus, and a B, which I think puts it as a C above Diplodocus. I think it does. So with that, Apatosaurus will go in C tier above Diplodocus and below Hoyangosaurus. Who is a cutie. Who is a cutie. Deserves cutie. Probably deserves that to be. Condition. Just on just on the fact of being a cutie. <laughs> it, was it was early. early. And I, I still stand by that it, it, it lacks all of the traits that make Hoyangosaurus yeah, it does. <laughs> but it is cute. It'd be like if they if they put in an absolutely adorable corgi into the game and called it Hoyangosaurus. It's like, oh, it's really cute. <laughs> it's not a Hoyangosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> so now, folks, it is time to spin, spin, spin that, that wheel. 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 The wheel? The wheel. Ooh, it's choppy. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. Nice. Okay. Yes. Also, I forgot to take a lower Titan off there. Whoopsies. Over Raptor. <laughs> That's fine. Over Raptor. All right. Well, Jimbo's, Jimbo's got to be in this one. one so. Well, thanks for joining us on a video about Brontosaurus and uh, the reality of the the unreality of of genera, and I guess also a little bit about Apatosaurus. Uh, remember to like, comment, and subscribe because it helps our channel. We have a Patreon. Uh, you can annoy us in Patreon. It's really just me in there talking about what, what's ever on my mind at any given moment, which is only in one of the sub pages, which is the movie one. Um, and catch us next time, where we will react to the dinosaur well, we spun. if you subscribe to our Patreon, there's a lot of bonuses, including having your name in the credits, which like our right on-screen now. right now. <laughs> Thank you to all of our patrons who <laughs> who donate enough to have their name in the credits. That um, all of we them. really, really appreciate you. And a special shout out to and a special thanks and shout out to our Gorgosaurus tier and above patrons, which, as of recording right now, are Benjamin Seepser, Philip Fico, Andrew Knittel, Florida Man, Max Ironpaw, Riley Shiro, and Wheat. So thank you to those patrons and to all of our patrons. And thank you to everyone who watches and engages with the video. We really appreciate it. We really like engaging with the community and we're happy that uh, we're getting such positive responses still from our content. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. See you guys.